You know, it's so wonderful when everyone is kibitzing and the camaraderie out there. It's hard to say, let's start this thing. So thank you all for coming early this morning. As usual, we have Rickoids missing because they were out too late last night. But I have to tell you, I talked to some of the oldies here, and they said, uh, I said, were you out till 2 or 3 in the morning? And they said, no, you know, we're hitting 50, 51. We had to go to bed at 11. And I said, well, that's all right. It hits us all. Um, I'm so happy that we're going to start a beautiful day this morning with our panel speaking about the challenges um, of the success of being a Nobel laureate, a dean of science. And I'm so happy that we have our moderator, Scott Commoner, RSI, who is now at the Harvard Business School on faculty. Um, you all are doing so well, so successful in many, many ways, and we're all so proud of you. So I don't need to talk because, um, well, I'm having throat problems, but I shouldn't need to talk anyway. Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thanks. <laughs> Let's uh, just you know, make sure we kick off by once again thanking Ms. D and Maite and everyone from the CEE uh, so much for everything they do. And then thank all of you for joining us bright and early this morning. Uh, before we start, two quick logistical notes. Uh, first, uh, I've been asked to ask all of you to silence your cell phones. And uh, while we're at it, I guess I should do that myself. <laughs> How else is this going to work? Interesting. I'm not going to like remove the battery. There we go. <laughs> uh, other one. Uh, all right, very good. Uh, second, I have to apologize on behalf of Professor Eric Maskin, uh, laureate in economics, who was supposed to be the fourth member of our panel, but can't be with us today due to a family emergency. Uh, he joined us five years ago, and since then he's been a lecturer at RSI. Uh, and he sends his best wishes and sincerest apologies for missing us, and we send him and his family all the best. Um, all right, now to get started in earnest. Uh, so I attended the Research Science Institute in 2004, then completed my bachelor's and PhD at Harvard. Uh, I was then the uh, inaugural research scholar at the Becker Friedman Institute at the University of Chicago, and I'm now back at Harvard, first having joined the Society of Fellows, and now the faculty of the Business School and the Economics Department. It is my tremendous honor to introduce the first panel. So starting here on my left, which I guess is your right, uh, Professor Wolfgang Ketele is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Physics at MIT. He leads a research group exploring new forms of matter of ultra-cold atoms, in particular novel aspects of superfluidity, coherence, and correlations in many body systems. He received a diploma from the Technical University of Munich in 1982 and completed his PhD in physics from the University of Munich in 1986. He did postdoctoral work at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics uh, in Garching. Is that amazing? Um, apologies, I'll be mispronouncing all sorts of things. And at the University of Heidelberg, then he came to MIT as a postdoc in 1990 and joined the faculty in 1993. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001, together with Cornell and Wyman, uh, for his observation of Bose-Einstein condensation in a gas and the first realization of an atom laser. It's pretty cool. In addition, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, the Optical Society of America, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Institute of Physics, and is a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences. His awards occur, include a David and Lucille Packard Fellowship, the Ravi Prize of the American Physical Society, the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Physics, the Knight Commander's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, and a Humboldt Research, Research Award. Please welcome Professor Catalet. <laughs> Next on the panel, we have Kit Poliano. She is the Dean of the Division of Biological Sciences and Professor of Molecular Biology at the University of California, San Diego. Her research focuses on cellular organization and dynamics, microbial interactions, and chemical cell biology. As Dean, she leads one of the world's best biological mm -hmm. sciences divisions, consistently ranked among the, uh, the top in biology research and in education. 
Uh, she herself is especially known for promoting inclusive high standards in research, education, and administration, something we certainly stand for here. And closer to home even more, she's responsible for the University of California San Diego's joint sponsorship of the USA BO. She received her PhD from the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Harvard Medical School and was a Damon Runyon Walter Winchell Postdoctoral Fellow at Harvard University. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and has received the Searle Scholar and Beckman Young Investigator Awards. Please welcome Dean Poliano. And last, uh, but certainly not least, we have Richard Schrock. He's the Frederick G. Keyes Professor of Chemistry at MIT. His lab works on projects ranging from exploratory synthesis to kinetics and mechanisms from catalytic reactions to applications in organic and polymer chemistry. This usually involves heavier metals from the earlier part of the transitional metal series, currently largely, I think that's molybdenum and tungsten, is that right? I'm trying to remember my uh, periodic table. He received his bachelor's in chemistry from the University of California, Riverside in 1967 and completed his PhD at Harvard in 1971. He then went to England for postdoctoral studies at Cambridge with Lord Jack Lewis and in 1972 was hired by DuPont Experimental Station in Wilmington, Delaware. He joined the faculty of MIT in 1975. Schrock was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2005 jointly with Grubbs and Chauvin for the development of, meta of the metathesis, met metathesis, metathesis, Either one, great. Uh, method in inorganic synthesis, work that he started while at DuPont. In addition, he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, as well as a foreign member of the Royal Society. His awards include an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, an Alexander von Humboldt Award, the ACS Award in Inorganic Chemistry, the August Wilhelm von Hoffmann Medal, and the uh, Paracelsus Prize. Paracelsus. Please welcome Professor Schrock. One of the problems when you have such distinguished guests is they have so many awards that you both have to figure out which ones to, to select and comment on. And then, you know, you always pick the ones that sound really cool and discover you can't pronounce them. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, I, think, I thought we would start the panel by having each of our guests tell us a little bit about sort of their career and, and sort of process of discovery, their past and current work, and, and what's the most fun about uh, their jobs. Uh, Professor Ketelet, why don't you start? Well, uh, there's maybe one thing I should just pick. The opportunity and the moment of discovery. I think for me, it is the most profound experience as a scientist to discover something new. If you have a laboratory, and I have several laboratories at MIT, in this lab, in each of my laboratories, I usually have a team of two or three graduate students, a postdoc and undergraduate student, and they run a room full of equipment. It's about the size of the stage, there are lasers, there's vacuum chamber, there are computers and electronics. And they go into this lab, sometimes they stay there all day, sometimes through the night, and they tweak the lasers, they fine adjust magnetic fields and all of that. And then, sometimes, on a computer monitor, we see that something new has happened, something which has not happened in nature before. And when, Scott, when you mentioned uh, my research, and I got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of Bose-Einstein condensation, this was, of course, the biggest such event. But it was really that you have a laboratory, you worked for months, sometimes for years, to improve the electronics, improve the lasers and that. And then, sometimes anticipated or unanticipated, is the moment of truth. Everything is working together. And then you take data and you literally see something which nobody on earth has seen before. And to be part of it, it's really a thrill. And I sometimes felt this is the real reward of a scientist, to know you've seen something where people were not even certain if it existed. And there are moments, 
Unfortunately, now, well, fortunately, unfortunately, most of the research is done by my students, so I usually have more regular hours and they stay late, and sometimes they tell me about their discoveries. <laughs> it feels almost as good as being part of it. But I still remember from many years ago, and you never forget those moments where you've been in the laboratory and you really was there the moment you almost want to scream because there's something new. And I often tell people, well, in science, we can still make discoveries. We have still the thrill of going beyond what people have done so far. Uh, in other areas of life, well, it's hard to discover new animals. It's hard to discover new mountains. It's even harder to discover new continents on Earth. But in <laughs> science, the moment of discovery still exists. Okay, so, so I have a dual life. I am both a faculty member with my own research effort and I'm a dean of biological sciences. So I'll just say a couple of words about both of those roles. Uh, so first, um, in my discovery and research, I study bacterial cells and have had the great pleasure of being able to work with really cutting edge microscopy and tools and to see my fundamental science have practical applications in antibacterial drug discovery. And that has been a real thrill in and of itself because I've been funded by the National Institute of Health for a research project that should have had no practical value whatsoever, but nonetheless was able to make this unanticipated discovery that you know, was able to impact human health. But in the process of discovery itself, the two things, in addition to just that, that amazing recognition that you've seen something totally new, there's two other things that I really find amazing about science or moments that I particularly enjoy. And one is when a new graduate student proposes an experiment or maybe a senior graduate student, maybe a new postdoc, and you say, oh, you know, I, I'm not really sure that's gonna work or I'm not really sure that's a good thing to do. And then they nonetheless do it anyway and get a fantastic result. And to me, as a mentor of students and postdocs, this is the best thing in the world because it shows that they are thinking independently and ready to get, go off on their own. And they're doing exactly what we're trying to do when we mentor students, which is create peers that are independently minded. And then the second thing is when you do an experiment where you think it's going to have a specific answer, you think you've got the world figured out, and you get an answer that's a, uh, incontrovertibly or whatever, you know, clearly 180 degrees the opposite of what you would have predicted. And that is the greatest thing of all, because that means that you have a whole new phenomenon to explore and to understand and that you need to dig in and think a little harder about the topic you're studying. So, so science is, the process of discovery is amazing. Uh, as the Dean of Biological Sciences, I have the great pleasure of leading a really wonderful department that's made amazing hires and just has great staff. At a time that I think is the best time in the world to be a biologist, the technologies that we're bringing on board is absolutely fantastic. We can do everything from manipulating the genome to um, change human, human cells and manipulate the human genome to manipulating uh, whole ecosystems. We can sequence uh, entire communities. We can watch neurons fire in the brain. And now we have to figure out a way to put all that information that we can gather back together into a picture of how the world works or how the human brain works. But it's demanding that we take a really holistic and much more interdisciplinary approach to science and that we be more cognizant of ethical and societal implications of our research because we have this amazing power at our hands. Everything that was science fiction just a few years ago is reality now. And so um, my job as, as Dean of Biological Science is, is um, to be, have the great ability, all my 100 faculty, my 260 PhD students, I get to see all of their great discoveries and I get to try to recognize and promote the really amazing talent among these individuals and try to recognize the future, future Nobel laureates and support their efforts. Create for them an environment that's really easy to do good science. Provides to them the freedom that they need and the access to cutting edge technologies while at the same time getting them to sometimes slow down and think about should they do this now or, and if so, how? And what are the societal implications of this? So that's kind of, those are my, the two worlds that I inhabit as a faculty member and as a dean. Thank you. Awesome. Well, my story is uh, a long one, and 
um, a bit unusual. I'll tell you a little bit about it. So I came from a very poor background in Indiana. I was born in Indiana. Uh, my parents didn't finish high school. They were basically uh, farmers in the beginning. My father was a carpenter, ultimately. But they had a great respect for education. So uh, I was introduced to science just because I was curious and um, learned a few things about the world around me. I'm not a biologist now. I'm an inorganic chemist. But uh, my brother, who was five years old, or one of them, gave me a chemistry set. And that was really what sparked my interest. So I proceeded through uh, school, went to college at the University of California, Riverside. And I'm back there again, by the way. I, I am there for three months. So back to my alma mater. Um, and then I went to Harvard to graduate school, and then you, you heard uh, I was a postdoc in England. And then I chose uh, DuPont to um, just to do what I wanted to do, because it was a very basic research environment at the time. So that was 1972. And these laboratories don't exist anymore, as everybody knows, uh, because uh, they're not economical. In fact, DuPont's chairman brags about that. He, he brags that uh, he has eliminated basic research. Anyway, in 1972, it was the place to be for me, and I was there till 1975. And in 1974, I made a discovery. I was given the, uh, the free hand to do what I thought was interesting. And I was interested in organometallic chemistry, so this is metal carbon bonds. And what was most interesting at the time was making polymers. So polyethylene, polypropylene, that's what DuPont did. That's what they wanted me to do. But moreover, they wanted me to do something interesting with the excuse of making a new polymer. And I did make a fundamental discovery. Uh, I won't go into detail about it, but it was a new kind of metal carbon bond instead of a single bond. It was a metal carbon double bond. And that turned out to be very important, uh, ultimately, in, in another area of catalysis called metathesis or metathesis. It depends on which side of the Atlantic you're on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I remember the day, in fact, I just received a notebook from a former student here at, at MIT who worked at DuPont. He extracted my notebook that's been reproduced in, in books and so on where the discovery was made and gave it to me. So I took it home last night and showed my wife the page. Um, where it was dated July 23rd, 1974. And I remember that quite clearly because I went home and I told my wife, I think I've done something important. That's a pretty strong statement. Uh, <laughs> usually you say, oh, how did it go? Oh, it's pretty good. But no, I said, I think I've done something important. And it turned out to be important. And, and Wolfgang's right, it's the most exciting Exciting thing, maybe the first time, like winning a Nobel Prize is the best time, but um, certainly it is uh, one of the most uh, thrilling things about being a scientist. So in 1975, I came to MIT, and I've been here ever since, and um, I've, I've developed that area, and it's still ongoing, and I have uh, six postdoctoral students now, and um, that's my group. So it's still exciting, and I still look forward to tomorrow. Thank you. So you've all had tremendous success. Um, and in describing sort of bits of how you got there and the, the, the moments of discovery, um, one thing that seems to come up is the themes of sort of freedom and, and openness to new ideas, the possibility that you know, it might be really exciting to find that your hypothesis was wrong and it did, things didn't act the way you expected. Um, how do we sort of, you know, what's most essential in creating that freedom and enabling you to explore in, in sort of blue sky space? Maybe I'll start that off, Wolfgang, if you mind. <laughs> so uh, obviously money. But uh, I think more important today, more than ever, is a, is a faith in science. And I think everybody here knows that that's in jeopardy today. And um, it's really sad to see it go in that direction, because ever since World War II, we've been going like this. And then at some point, there was sort of a, 
a plateau and now we seem to be down on the other side and accelerating rapidly. And that certainly doesn't help the process of funding or discovery or the destiny of man in general. Well, I would say I'm fortunate and privileged that I can do my professional work in a place and environment where this element of discovery is appreciated. I have a position in physics, and physics is about fundamental research. And my funding comes from the NSF or from the fundamental physics research programs of the DOD and from NASA. And uh, my job is really to explore something new. And I've never had any, even a question or any problem if I propose something in my research proposal and what I'm doing is very different. Actually, this is even uh, systematic. When I hire a graduate student, and of course, the graduate student wants to know what is the research, and I tell them about the research. But often after explaining them with great excitement, look, this is what you should do, and this is how important it is, and such. And then I say, well, but if in the next five years you do just that, maybe it wasn't the most exciting thesis, because the most exciting thesis take a new turn, and, you, and based on you know, new developments in the field, we go into a different direction. So in that sense, I'm fortunate that I live in a world where this is appreciated, where this is supported and funded, but I'm very concerned that those places where this is possible and the research funding which supports that is shrinking. For me, there is no doubt that it is in this space that we develop the concepts for the technology for tomorrow. My research has not led to direct applications, but I'm certain that the insight into new forms of matter and a deeper understanding of how materials work will have a long-lasting effect and lead to applications which people outside the scientific community will enjoy maybe in 30 years. So I haven't had maybe the thrill you had that the results of your research have already affected uh, pharmaceutical uh, applications. So anyway, my summary is there are places where this really exists and I don't feel I have to fight off for it because it exists in my research area supported by funding. But the big concern is that this is threatened and the budget for this kind of research is rather shrinking than growing. Perfect place to hear from a dean. Yeah, so, so I will add to that and that is um, the funding is a particular concern in two different areas for me as dean. The first is gaining funding for young investigators. When um, faculty are starting out their independent research career, it's really often it takes years for them to get the funding they need to really take their ideas that you hired them for and turn that into a discovery. Many of the funding agencies are risk adverse and um, young faculty are at risk. They don't have the track record that I have now, having had my lab for 20, 23 years. Um, they don't have, the, their ideas sometimes sound different from the people on the study section, right? They phrase things differently. They use new techniques that people may or may not be aware of. And so they have a really challenging time getting those really, truly new ideas uh, funded. And the same is true for established investigators that want to do something totally new and different and risky. And so it's incredibly important to have the funding, the Young Investigator Awards that uh, I enjoyed when I was a junior faculty member had a huge, played a huge role in my career, allowing me to buy the very expensive equipment that I needed to do the cutting edge microscopy at the time and giving me the freedom to pursue this. It took, my, it took me, it was 12 years of fundamental science before we saw any glimmer of a practical application. And so it really does illustrate the value of fundamental basic research that are, is just discover, you're trying to discover new things about the world and how the, how the world works and how we have to continue investing in that basic science, not only because it's of great intellectual value to understand how the world works, but also because there may be an application in the future that we just can't yet see. But if we don't nurture the young talent, we'll never get from here to there. Yeah, well, 
nurturing young talent, extremely important. Uh, certainly something that everyone in this room has literally been a part of, thanks to, uh, thanks to the CEE through RSI and USABO and everything else. Um, we have many, uh, many young scientists in the room for different varied definitions of young, um, and they're staring at potentially the starts of those 12-year project horizons. Um, there were little bits of advice for them uh, in the last set of remarks, but I wonder if you could speak more directly to sort of what they should be thinking about as they start out uh, or, or continue their programs. Yeah, sure. sure, go Can for I it. start on this one? So, All yours. Um, so my work was continuously funded by the National Institute of Health for starting when I started out. Um, so for those of you who are thinking about going that route, I would say um, keep your risky aim either secret or make it aim for. And make the rest of them something that pretty much anyone in your field can understand. Because if, you, if people in your field can't understand it, you might be 100% spot on, uh, but that's not going to get you the dollars you need to do your work. So. So keep the truly revolutionary thing, um, you know, kind of a little quiet at the proposal stage, and then you know, publish it in Nature. So that'll get their attention and show that they were a rockhead, which you might have known all along when you read their reviews of your grant. <laughs> Let me quickly interject that that advice accords very much with one of the best pieces of advice I got at RSI, which was from Jenny Sandova about giving presentations, that every presentation should start with something that everyone in the room understands, then you should move on to something that only you understand and you end with something that nobody yet understands. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's, uh, I hear this question often and I often, all of us get it. Uh, what, 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 should I, what should I do, what should I study? And, um, my, my main advice is that discover what you're really good at and what, what you like doing. I mean, if you, if you don't like biological sciences, then you can't force yourself to do it. Or if you don't like physics, you can't force yourself to do it. Uh, you have to be sort of naturally drawn to it. And I was naturally drawn to what I do. Ultimately, as I look back, I'm, I'm not certain how I got there, but that's where I ended up. Uh, do you like to make things? Do you like to measure things? Do you like to, to have applications? Do you like to engineer things? And one, once you discover what you like to do, maybe there should be a series of courses that would sort of expose you to all of those uh, um, sort of uh, uh, types of research. Then you can discover what you like to do, and that's what you should study. I mean, you shouldn't try to study something that you aren't good at and that you don't like to do virtually all the time, which is what many scientists do. Well, uh, I would say, well, advice is you should be prepared for seeing, you know, having sort of tension. You want to think big but then you have to choose among available options. You want to think about the big concepts in your research, but then you have to go to the laboratory and fix the pump. So you have to understand that things are not always as glamorous. The glamorous moment is there, this motivates us. But then you have to get your hands dirty, and sometimes it's frustrating. And sometimes you maybe even feel the glamorous, the glamour has disappeared. You maybe figure out that the big thing you want to do is impossible because nature wasn't so kind to, you know, provide an opportunity to do what you had figured out in your head. But maybe then you have to settle for something. You have to finish your work. You have to document what was possible. And instead of a nature paper or cell paper, it just becomes a technical report. But this is also important. So in other words, you, you want to dream big, but you also have to sort of do the little daily dirty work, and you have to go through a lot of hard work, and it is sometimes a combination of this solid work, and suddenly there is something opening up. So in other words, if you choose an area because you dream to make a discovery or such, but you do not love what you do every single day, you're not going to make this discovery. 
solid advice uh, and appreciated. Um, I'm, in a second, we're going to open up to the panel, but I just want to, or to the, the audience, but I just want to jump off that last remark for a second. In those moments when you're, when the day is a slog, you know, the experiment's not running the way you want, or you just got those negative referee reports, uh, you know, sort of all of these, you know, sort of ways in which the day-to-day -day life, you know, can, can be unglamorous en route to the extraordinary discovery. What do you do? How do you maintain your energy? Uh, you know, what keeps you going? Um, asking for a friend or something. <laughs> well, let me give you a, it's, it's a real story, but uh, one of the big setback I had in my earlier career was we had built a machine and there was a mishap. Some student did a mistake and we had an ultra high vacuum chamber. It took months to get the vacuum and to get everything going. And there was a mistake. Something was overheated, melted, and water was pouring out into this ultra high vacuum chamber. We were just in an exciting phase. The students called me to the lab and showed it to me. And you know, you just, yeah, everybody pulls a long face. We know what it meant, and it meant a big, big setback. And the only thing I could say was, uh, all right, should we go for beer or something? I mean, should we just, <laughs> for a moment, just you know, face it? And the students said, no. They took out the wrenches and took the machine apart the same afternoon. So. Never give up. Sometimes you have to fight, and but you have to be prepared for it. And well, I sometimes tell people, or even tell my family as a job description, in research, 99% of the time, your experiment doesn't work because you're building something new, and then it works, and then you take data, but this is done in a few weeks, and you write the paper, and then you try again something which may never work. So it is your job description that 99% of the time you have an experiment which is not working, and part of it is frustration. So your job description is, if you are aiming for this kind of thing, to live with frustration 99% of your time. So you better figure out a way to cope with that. That's, that is exactly right. And I will say that on, in the, on a personal basis, I try to go to the gym every morning because that really does help deal with frustration, I'll say. Um, but uh, you know, some t the other thing I'll say is that it is true that things fail a lot. And sometimes they fail for various random reasons, but sometimes you're just trying to approach the problem from the wrong angle. And if you buckle in and keep just trying harder or, mi or doing minor little tweaks to the problem, you won't ever get, th get to the answer that you're trying to get to. So there is also some, some point at which you need to be willing to, or you need to recognize it's time to step back and try to approach the problem from a totally different angle. And I think that's something that um, a lot of people can have a hard time with it at times, knowing when it's time to maybe give up on this specific part of a project and start all over again. So being willing to start something new from a different angle, possibly with new collaborators who might bring a, a different way of thinking about the problem to bear if you're really devoted to getting an answer to a particular problem and you've hit a road, technical roadblock. So, um, yeah, thanks. You stole my answer. Um, <laughs> I guess I, it was in 1978. I had a group of six or seven students, and um, uh, research was going well. And several of them were, were were runners. Of course, that was the running time in the 70s and 80s. And uh, I'm I'm not built like the typical runner. I'm too big. But I decided that you know I was I was really edgy, and when things would go wrong. Um, they would go out for a run, and so I decided to start doing that. And so that, I started jogging. And if, if you go for a very long jog, you find that your, mi your mind is just totally empty almost, and you're, just, uh, you're not thinking about anything really, but then, then something happens, and, and an idea comes up, and it's uh, been documented throughout science that in times when you just let your mind wander, whatever it is, even in a dreamlike state, you, you get ideas and you see, moreover, that maybe what you're doing, you, you 
struggled with so long is actually the wrong way to go about it. So my advice is to get exercise and, and get some sleep. Sleep is, of course, also very important. Awesome. Uh, once again, thank you all for getting up here early, which you know counts against sleep. Before our panelists all lead us on a run, uh, let's take questions from the audience. Uh, I think we're, we're set up with mics down here, so anyone who, who wants to ask a question, please just come down to one of the sides so we can get your question loud and clear and recorded. All right. Well, while people get ready, I'm still running and actually I'm preparing for the Boston Marathon. <laughs> But I have to say, I can't solve any science problem or even think about <laughs> sci uh, science when I'm running. It depends, actually. If I run fast and challenge myself, I'm just thinking about the next mile. I'm watching my stride. And it's actually something good. When I'm running, if people ask me, what are you thinking about? And I'm saying, just about running, you know. <laughs> you look on the street, you enjoy the, inv you look left and right. Maybe there is sun, maybe there is snow, maybe there is ice on the charles. But... It's not, I, I'm not regarding running <laughs> if I'm uh, t pushing myself hard as a time where I can solve anything. But afterwards, oh yeah, you feel relaxed. And that's a good peace of mind. So here's a, here's a question that I've wanted to ask at one of these uh, uh, laureates panels before, which is in your careers, I mean, you've uh, achieved these great discoveries. Do you feel like you've found the appropriate work-life balance? What's your... Uh, balance between your time in the lab and and with family or, or other things and uh, and and do you think your family would agree with 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 that? Well, let me give one answer to that. Uh, Work-life balance, yeah, is now often used. I would put it in this way: there were times I neglected my family to do physics. But then there have been times where I neglected physics to take care of my family. So I think it is an illusion, at least for many of us, to balance life and work at any given time. Because there are always some demands on this side and on that side. Your family is in crisis. Your children really need you. And then you cancel meetings at work. But then it's really exciting in the lab and you want to stay overnight and not come home for dinner. This is when you neglect your family. So I would feel, uh, my advice is yes, look for the balance, but don't expect to find it on any given day or any given week. The best you can aim for that over, I would even say several years, if you then average over several years, you've, kind, you've found some kind of balance. I still feel unbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the balance uh, came for me uh, during the busiest part of my career. Uh, I had my first son in uh, 1978 and then second in 81. And those are, those are pretty uh, formative years and I, I worked hard. In fact, my youngest son, born in 81, he says uh, he, he went on and became very good in math. Now he's a computer scientist. but he said, I don't want to work as hard as a dad did. But my wife points out that I was always home for dinner. So you've got to have time every day and spend part of your day with your family. And for me, it was dinner time, I guess. And then I'd work at night and, and so on, leave early in the morning. But I was always home for dinner. So that's important every day. That's great. So. So I'll say two things. First, um, my brother is an executive in the ski industry, and he spends his life skiing, and then he goes on vacations where he goes surfing and windsurfing. And so I often say, we have balance as a family. The two siblings are really balanced. And so, so um, you know, so sort of in addition to, to balancing over your temporal after different stages of your life, you can also balance across the family. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, but seriously, um, I have, I had my, first child when I was a PhD student, and my husband is also a scientist. And so um, we have now two children, and 
We both are faculty members, and we take a real team approach to raising our family and having a success, successful career. We do, we have um, a, one of these marriages where we do almost everything together. We teach together, we have some joint research projects, and we kind of do tag team on the family. And we do try to be home for dinner as many of the evenings as we can with our children. But we, you know, often it's just one of us is able to be there. And happily now they're old enough that they can kind of start to take care of themselves. But I'll say without that real team approach, it wouldn't have worked. And we also made the decision to always have someone around the house, first helping with the children, serving as a nanny. And now we have um, someone who serves effectively the role that a, a, you know, a wife would normally serve, doing the laundry and often the cooking and driving the kids around to sports. And so you know, without that household help, we would have been nowhere, I will say. So um, you can achieve balance. So don't hesitate if you are thinking about raising a family and having a high pressure career, hire people, spend part of your salary on getting someone to help you out because you um, will likely need it. Uh, fantastically effective strategies throughout. I particularly like the one uh, you know, about involving your family in the research enterprise. Uh, I know that RSI has now had you know, several children of former Rickoids come back and be members of the program as well. And this is a great way to get work and, and life balance at the same time. Uh, anyhow, on to our next question. Uh, research is uh, frequently a team effort. And uh, we're all familiar with this, the uh, saying that managing physicists is like herding cats. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, in your experience, how do you handle the situation where you have a team, but one of the team members is, is not a team member? I think this has been a challenge until the present day. I've, I'm on a learning curve for all my life how to handle such situations. And I think it's in the end just use your best judgment. And I should say sometimes what I learn in managing my research group, I apply to my children. And sometimes, which has worked for my children, I apply to my research group. <laughs> So I would say um, I, I handle these situations by s sitting the person down and having a frank conversation with them, starting with um, explore, explaining the value that they bring to the project, and then moving into my expectations for how to work with a research group. You know, these are things that we don't learn, at least in biology. We're not really trained to have these kind of managerial conversations. But the thing to, to keep in mind is that if you as a, are taking the time as a faculty member to have this difficult conversation with someone, you're making a big investment in that person. And so you know, if you receive conversations like uh, you know, this sort of corrective feedback yourself, it's because somebody cares deeply about you and is trying to help you be the best person that you can. And so the same works if you approach it with this, here's a person and you're trying to help them be the best they can, and you invest that time into the conversation with them. It can sometimes help, sometimes it doesn't, of course, but at least you've put, made your very best effort. Yeah, I, I, I have never been involved in large collaborative projects that you might be referring to, uh, where you have 100 people on the project, and you know whether it's LIGO or whatever, the human genome. This is a difficult situation. But within the group, there's certainly, every, every day there was um, someone who complained or you know, wasn't a team player, you might say. But I try, I try to give my people more or less something that they can independently study. So it's really up to them. Uh, they don't have to be a team player to be inquisitive and to make a real discovery and to develop that discovery into something useful. Uh, if they don't do it, then that's their fault. But uh, I, I haven't had a lot of experience in um, some rebellious um, uh, team member who won't who won't who won't um, be a team player. So I'm, I don't have a lot of experience. That's all I can say. I'm curious about the relationship between academia and industry. You mentioned Dupont supporting basic research in the past, and then forgoing it now. Uh, I'm currently involved in machine learning, where there seems to be. Uh, strong trend into industry. 
they have concentration of talent and compute and data, um, and a lot of the breakthroughs are happening there. I'm curious whether you'd advise us to push for more basic science in industry, or if you think that approach is risky and instead we need to pull more of it back out into the universities and more traditional academic environments, or whether there's some healthy balance. Uh, who's doing the pushing and pulling? Uh, <laughs> well, all of us. I mean, all what, of us. Okay. You mentioned funding earlier, right? Should we be advocating for better funding for academia, or should we be pushing some of these large, powerful organizations to get more involved with basic research? Well, if the large, powerful organization's goal is to make money, you're going to have uh, difficulty extracting it in large quantities from them. So, uh, if it's a foundation then, uh, yeah, I mean, some people think that that's, this, that's an important direction. Large foundations, people who have money, founding foundations to sponsor research. Um, uh, getting, getting more money out of traditional resources means a government that agrees that that's the best way to go. And I don't know what's going to happen in the near future with regard to funding for science in this administration, but um, it's kind of, well, I just don't know. I don't think anybody knows. So far, there hasn't been any dire event, but it, it could happen. And I'm not sure that we, as scientists, can do much about it. We can write letters, we can you know, sign long letters, get thousands of people's signatures, but in the end, it's the people in, in Congress and other parts of government that make the decisions. And uh, we can make as much noise as possible, and I think we should. And that's uh, certainly what we have to focus on. So, so my connection to industry is really via the pharmaceutical industry. And there, um, the costs of bringing a drug to market are so extraordinary. And the return on the investment in my, uh, in my field, which is antibacterial drug discovery, is so minuscule that basic discovery no longer, basic research in this field no longer really exists in industry to any substantial amount, and in fact, a lot of the companies are getting out of antibacterial drug discovery every year. Um, you, more and more of my colleagues in the field have their entire unit, dozens of people laid off with weeks notice. Um, so, it, um, so it's not really a stable place for, for, for basic science, and even the early stages of antibacterial drug discovery. I'll say that that pipeline is it, and that also that for neglected tropical diseases is broken. And we need some new way of funding early stages of discovery for drugs that don't return, make a major return on the investment in terms of dollars, but can have a major return on human quality of life. And um, so we really need to think about different ways to fund this. And I'll also say the other um, thing, um, industry can often do really fantastic pioneering work, they can have access to tools and teams of people that can do what we can't do in academia, and that can be really fantastic. The drawback that I see is that that research is often never published, never made public, and therefore other people can't build off of it. And in my field, that has led people to try to do the same thing to discover new antibacterial drugs that have failed repeatedly in industry, and if you don't have the connections to know that you shouldn't be doing this, and if it's never published, then we're doomed to continue to waste money doing things that are doomed to failure. So, um, so we need to find the right balance between industry and academia. And I'm convinced that there is a great connection to be made there where um, we can work with industry um, to help translate early discoveries from uh, biological sciences, in my case, into new applications and new um, industries. And I think we're, we're working on that in various forms of incubator spaces and collaborative spaces that are growing up on more and more campuses. And I think those are really important steps. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Overall, my question is how do you change minds on a scientific topic? So um, I really appreciated Dean Poliano's uh, suggestion to hide your revolutionary ideas in specific game three uh, or four, uh, and then you know get them in the gut with the nature paper later. But when you're in a field that has had uh, high profile um, scientists and, and high profile publications even that are repeatedly trying to make a particular point, and yet um, what you sort of see when you look around is that the field is not really adopting these ideas, 
um, what do you do? So I've been thinking about a sort of multi-pronged approach with education, um, sort of running workshops, um, trying to get it into, you know, get these ideas into, say, graduate and undergraduate education, um, funding vehicles, multi-site collaborations, you know, different kinds of uh, visibility things, writing better, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes it could be that it's just too dense, better software tools to get people to adopt what's going on. And, um, but I'm at the stage in my career where I feel like I don't know which of these is good to do, so I'm in danger of trying all of them. And I was wondering if, with your wisdom, uh, any of you would suggest a certain profile of effort towards those kinds of pursuits, or maybe a different direction to go with how to change minds um, in a field. Thank you. Sorry to say that this sounds really formulaic or theoretical. I mean, minds change because you make people think. It's the power of the word, the power of articulation. If I talk to my colleagues and I explain a new idea well, they will jump at it. So I think it's just the clarity of thought. But of course, in a community of researchers, it takes time. If you know, a few people realize that, maybe start shifting their research in a new direction. And then depending if they are successful, a larger and larger community realizes that. So I've never felt I need a strategy to change mind. It, it, you know, if science moves forward, people realize it, and and it's that it's a it's the ability of or the, the the skill of all people who do science to embrace new ideas. But we have seen examples that ideas appear maybe in an obscure way hidden in theoretical papers, hidden in complicated equations. It sometimes needs a, a person also to explain it clearly and make the new idea stand out. Yeah, so on an individual discovery basis, I, that's ex I, I agree with this. I have had the, the joy, I suppose, of, of demonstrating that some high profile papers were completely wrong. And that's really painful because everybody thinks the world is one way and you're showing that they were totally wrong and they miss something terrible happened with the paper. And there you have to accept that correcting the field, you won't get the same recognition as the person who published the, the paper. You know, initially, it won't, the, it won't be published in the same high profile journal. But I, I think you, might, you also touched upon uh, broader societal kinds of questions. So for example, you know, there is a maybe climate change or you know, the value of immunization, there are these things that are slow to be adopted uh, by our culture. And the question is how to start to change the mind so that people are actually understand the value of immunization and why they should do it for their children and not rely on her, everyone else doing it. And there, uh, your approaches of, of education and communicating really clearly to the public are clearly important. And one thing I would add to that is trying to um, truly understand what people who don't believe in these facts are thinking and why they believe that way and truly connect with them at the level where they are today and try to speak to them from where they're coming from. And that, if you can understand the issues that they're having, then you might, you can start to, they'll understand that you respect them and are respecting their point of view and then you might be able to shift them. But unless you, unless you establish that you respect them and you're not speaking down to them, they, you'll never move them. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot to add, but I, I think that there, there are two parts to this. Uh, you're trying to convince your colleagues, that's the scientific method through publications and everything that you talked about, giving talks and so on, uh, giving, talking to people who know, can appreciate what you've done, and then there is everybody else, and some of whom are not really prepared to admit that you know even science is truthful and that uh, there is such a thing as a scientific method and so on. So I think as far as uh, within your discipline, you can, you can have a lot of effect just doing what scientists do, but outside is, is much more difficult. And of course, uh, historically, there have been people who have not been appreciated until after they've uh, passed on. So that's, we don't want to go that far, but that's... Uh, <laughs> It's uh, it's a uh, you just you just have to keep at it and do your best. 
Awesome. Well, you've all set the bar very high for all of us, right? You know, to go out and do extraordinary science and communicate it to people, uh, even if that means learning and, and really getting to know them, understand where they're coming from and, and whether they be scientists or, or people out in the world. Uh, you've given us a fantastic set of advice and toolkit to do it, and in particular reminded all of us that we also need to make it to the gym, go out in a run, or uh, you know whatever it is to keep ourselves energized. Uh, let's thank, let me thank all of you, and then let's thank our panelists. You rock! Thank you so much. <laughs>